and look at the great trial that he went through as a father. Um, before I get into all of that, though, I want to uh, I want to share this. This is an inscription on a cathedral clock, and this was this is what it reads there, and, and it, it really began to minister to me this morning because when I look in a mirror and see. Uh, no hair or white hair, um, <laughs> I, I realize that I might not be as young as I once was, although I try daily to convince myself that I still am just a young fella. Settle down. I'll do the preaching. <laughs> when as a child I laughed and wept, time crept. When as a youth I dreamed and talked, time walked. When I became a full-grown man, time ran. And later, as, I, as older I grew, time flew. Soon I shall find, while traveling on, time is gone. Isn't that amazing? One of these days, the, the clock's going to run out. And while this is a great little inscription, the scriptural truth that, that this upholds is, in my opinion, especially in the days that we live today, it is vital that we study and check ourselves out. The Bible says that we're to work out our own salvation. Now, the world has twisted that to the place where working out my own salvation says that I can make salvation work for me. And salvation only will work for you when the salvation that you obtain comes from the Bible and comes from the voice and the, and the nature and the character of God. Well, listen, Pastor, that's just, that's just not all that true. I mean, there's many ways to heaven. Well, try any of them except the way that goes through Christ, and you'll be very disappointed. Because He is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man goes to the Father except through Jesus. In other words, church, we have to line up with Him. He's not going to line up with us. Can I just tell you something? The, the, the world... The world, we are going around the world. The world ain't going around us. And that's the way it is with God. And in the, in, this morning, I, I want to ask you to turn to uh, the very first book in the Bible, the book of Genesis. I want to go to chapter 22, and I'm going to ask you to stand when you get there, because I want to read these verses of Scripture. Uh, Genesis chapter 22, starting in verse 1. It's a familiar story, but there are new things that, you dis that we can discover in God's Word that, that doesn't change the context of God's Word, but it changes how we see God's Word. Amen? Amen. So I want to turn to Genesis 22 and verses 1 through 18. Now it came to pass. Say it came to pass. Came to pass. That is a good thing when it comes to pass. Amen? And it came to pass... After these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. Then he said, Take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains with which I will tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, and he saddled his donkey, and he took two of his young men with him, and Isaac, his son, and split the wood for the burnt offering, and arose and went to the place of which God told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship, and we will come back to you. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son, and took the fire in his hand and took a knife, and the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, Father, and he said, Here I am, my son. And then he said, look, the fire and the wood, but where's the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, God, my son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. 
Then they came to the place of which God told him, and Abraham built an altar there and placed the wooden order, and he bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood, and, upon, and Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, Here I am. And he said, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. So Abraham went over and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. Abraham called the place the Lord will provide. As it is so, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time out of heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your, your son, your only son, Blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore. And your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. God, I pray right now, Lord, that this word that we have heard in our ears that we've seen with our eyes God I pray that it would get in our understanding and it would get in our spirit and we would begin to understand that that some things that come our way are hard things some things are not fun and games but God if you're involved if it's what you're calling us to God it will be worth it all when we see Jesus it will be worth it all when we understand and recognize the growth that is coming our way because we are of our act of obedience and because we're standing on the promises of almighty god now lord i need your anointing to declare your word your people need your anointing today to receive your word lord your word the anointing destroys every yoke of bondage lord loose your people let them receive this morning not from a preacher but from your word and from your spirit and I pray every church in this town today that's preaching your word, I pray, God, that your presence would be there and that lives would be transformed. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. amen. And amen. You may be seated. Wow. It's already been a fantastic service. We could just say amen, call it a day, and leave. And, and, and feel like that we have been... In church, we've certainly been in the presence of God, and, and uh, dads, whether you realize it or not, you are in school. You are in school. Can I tell you something, dads? Your wife isn't going to be the one standing before the Lord and giving account for your family. You are. Oh, amen. Preach on, brother. Okay. It's the man's responsibility. And men, we have pawned it off on the women way too long. It's time for the men of God to rise up and be counted. It's time. At the, at the ripe young age of 75, Abraham enrolled in the school of faith. Now he is over a hundred and he's still having soul stretching experiences. Church, you're never too old to, to do something for God. I was hoping for more right there. <laughs> we are never too old to face new challenges. We are never too old to fight new battles. We are never too old to learn new truths. In fact, in fact, when you stop learning, when, when we stop actively trying to gain wisdom and understanding from the Word of God and from God Himself, we are in real trouble. When we stop learning, we stop growing. And when we stop growing, we stop living. 
When we stop learning, we stop growing. And when we stop growing, we stop living. Genesis 22 records the greatest test that Abraham ever faced. And true, it also presents a beautiful picture of our Lord's sacrifice at Calvary. But the main lesson is obedient faith that overcomes the trials of life. How many of you realize as a child of God, you're going to go through some trials? You're going to go through some tribulation. The world is in direct opposition to everything that God's Word stands upon. The, the world out there is directly opposed to it. The, 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 the author and the finisher of our faith has declared one way. The world says, no, that's not true. In fact, it started in the garden with the serpent talking to Eve. Well, did he really say that? Does God's word really say that? That's what the world is still saying to the church today. Did God, did God well, that's just, a, that's just a hateful church. That, that guy that I was talking to down in Rogue River, after I told him, no, I do believe that you can walk away from God. You can absolutely lose your, he said, well, I would never go to your church. And I said, well, sir, that is your prerogative. You don't have to come to my church. But if you're going to a church that says you can live like hell and still make heaven your home, you're in the wrong house, son. Because the Bible makes it very clear, church, that, that sin separates me from God. And if I'm living, I don't care how many times you've come to the altar. If your life is riddled with sin, and, and I'm, ta I'm, I'm talking about myself because my life has been, but there's something inside of me that keeps compelling me back to the altar, compelling me back to the place of salvation where I come before God and say, oh God, forgive me. Listen, it's not the sin that keeps you, well, it, it is, but more than the sin that keeps you, is your refusal to go back before the Lord and say, God, forgive me. You can't, you can't get into heaven by saying that the, 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 devil, the devil made me do it. You know why? Because you have to concede to the devil. The devil only has the power over you that you allow him to have. Because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. That's what God's word says. I'm standing on that. The Bible says if we believe in our heart and confess with our mouth, you shall be saved. Abraham teaches us how to face and handle the tests of life to the glory of God. And in the school of faith, we must have occasional tests or we'll never know where we are spiritually. There's, listen, I hated testing day in school. I hated it. Anybody, in, anybody with me on that one? So, my glory, I'm in the right, I'm in the right house. I hated that day. I thought it was mean. Okay, you go into class and the teacher stands in front of the class. No warning at all. Pop quiz. Are you kidding me? Pop quiz. What's that all about? It's because he wants to know where your learning is and what you've received and what you've retained throughout this week or month or semester or whatever. It just, it just I, I don't want you to have time to study. I just want to see what you know. That's what pop quizzes are. How many of you realize this morning that God is really good at pop quizzes? And I don't like them any better than I like the ones that I got in school. But we have to be prepared. The Bible says we're to study to show ourselves approved. Workmen rightly dividing the word of truth. That gentleman, as good as his intentions are, he's not rightly dividing the word of truth. And you know where it starts? In their pulpit. I'm not tearing that church down. I'm just saying that they're out there and they are leading people awry. We don't even do, we do not even do any outreach. We don't, we, our church isn't about, it's just, listen, if you're, if you're not, you're not following the commission. We're not to hold the fort till Jesus comes, church. We're to go in the highways and the hedges and compel the lost to come in. Amen. 
Abraham had his share of tests right from the beginning. First, the first one was the family test when he had to leave his loved ones and step out by faith to go to a new land, Genesis chapter 11 through Genesis chapter 12. And this was, the, was, was followed by the famine test in which Abraham failed because he doubted God when he went to Egypt for help. And then back once back in the, in the land, Abraham passed the fellowship test when, when he gave Lot his first choice in, 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 in using the pasture land. And he also passed the fight test in chapter 14 when he defeated the kings and the fortune test when he said no to Saul to Sodom's wealth in verses 17 through 24 but he failed the fatherhood test when Sarah got impatient with God and suggested that Abraham have a child by Hagar isn't it amazing that in Genesis chapter 22 God refers to Isaac as God's as 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 Abraham's only child I find that amazing why pastor because he was outside of the will of God he was outside of the promises of God he was outside of the test parameters that God had set well, 75 years old or whatever it was when, 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 when we, we, we got the news and here I'm 100 years old now and Sarah's womb's dead. And I'm an old man. But God, but God, listen, it's never too late in, God, in God's kingdom. It's never, it's never too late. He failed the fatherhood test. And when the time came to send Ishmael away, Abraham passed the farewell test, even though it broke his heart. And not Because not every difficult experience in life is necessarily a personal test from God, church. You have to remember that. Not every difficult experience is necessarily a personal test from God. And you and I need, we need, we need, we need, we not need, we must, Learn to distinguish between trials and temptation. You need to learn the difference between trials and temptation. Why? Because God does not tempt us. God will allow trials. God will bring trials our way to see where we are. But He will not tempt us. So why would God give Abraham a son and then ask Abraham to kill him? All believers face similar temptations to sin, but not all believers experience the same trials of faith. God's testings are tailor-made for every child of God, and every experience is unique. God never asked Lot to face the test that Abraham faced. The question might come up as to why, and it's very simple. It's because Lot was being tempted by the world and the flesh and never grew to the place of maturity that Abraham had reached. Never, never, he never made it that far. He just didn't. In one sense, it, it, it's a compliment when God sends us a test. It shows that God wants to promote us in the school of faith. God never sends a test until he knows you're ready for it. Listen. Our faith is not really tested until God asks us to bear what seems unbearable. Do what seems unreasonable or expect what seems impossible. Isn't that amazing? Our faith isn't tested until God asks us to bear what seems unbearable. To do what seems unreasonable or expect uh, what seems impossible and so whether you look at it at Joseph when he was in prison whether you look at Moses and and Israel at the Red Sea or David in the cave or Jesus at Calvary the lesson is the same we live by promises listen we live by promises not explanation hello we live by promises, not by explanation. God's not going to explain everything to you. 
He's going to call you to walk by faith. Consider how unreasonable God's request was to Abraham. Isaac was his only son. And the future of the covenant rested in Isaac. If you go back and begin to line everything up, the future of the covenant rested in Isaac. Isaac was a miracle child. He was the gift of God to Abraham and Sarah in response to their faith. And Abraham and Sarah loved Isaac. They built their whole future around him. And when God asked Abraham to offer his son, he was testing Abraham's faith, hope, and love. And it looked like God was wiping out everything Abraham and Sarah had lived for. But can I just shed a little bit of light on the entirety of the subject? If you go back to the, in, in the first several verses of, of chapter 22, there's a little word in there that you have to understand and you have to, you have to see it. Because God, um, Abraham said to the servants that he left at the bottom of the hill, the lad and I are going to go and worship, but we will come back he didn't say I'm coming back he said we will come back that is an act of faith that is a step of that is a declaration that some way somehow it was it did it seemed unbearable it seemed unreasonable it was it, it, it seemed to expect what was impossible but some way somehow whether God resurrected his son or whether God miraculously provides a, a way of sacrifice he said the son my lad the lad and I will return When God sends a trial to you and I, our first response is usually, why, Lord? And then, why me? Why, Lord? And why me? And right away, we want God to explain it to us. Why you, <laughs> am I the only one that said, God, why am I going through all this mess? Paul wrote more of the New Testament than anybody else and, and was a, a, truly a man uh, that, that, that knew of God. And God, he, 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 he did all kinds of miracles, established churches, all that kind of stuff. And he had a problem and he went to the, before the Lord three times and said, deliver me from this. And God told him every time, my grace is sufficient. God's grace, church, is sufficient. God's grace continues to work as long as we come to get more grace. Amen. Abraham heard God's word and he immediately obeyed it by faith. He didn't wait. He didn't question. He immediately obeyed. He knew that God will never contradict His promise. I'm telling you, church, God's Word is God's Word. And He will not go against His own Word, ever. Not going to do it. So, so Abraham held on to the promise in Genesis 21 and 12. In Isaac shall thy seed be called. And so Abraham believed that even if he, if he allowed him to kill his son, he would raise Isaac from the dead. Listen, faith does not demand explanation. Faith rests on promises. Faith rests on promises. Two statements reveal the emphasis of this passage. Number one, God will provide himself a lamb for the burnt offering. And Jehovah Jireh, which means the Lord, the Lord will see to it. That is, the Lord will provide. Jehovah Jireh. And so as he climbs Mount Moriah with his son, Abraham was confident that God would meet every need. And Abraham could depend on the promises and the provision of the Lord. If Abraham could, could rely and count on the promises and the provision of the Lord, let me break the news to you, so can you. We can. We can. It's because we're his children. He'd experienced already the resurrection power of God in his own body. And so he knew that God could raise Isaac from the dead if indeed that was his plan. <laughs> I've looked at the passage so many times and it just boggles my mind because he's a hundred years old 
And Isaac, his son, has got to be like 25 or 30 years of age. So he's in pretty good shape probably. Probably could have took his dad, but he obediently allowed his father to tie him up, to bind him, and put him on the altar. There were questions running through his mind up the hill. Um, I got the wood, and here's the fire, and there's the knife, but uh, where's the sacrifice? Don't think for one second that Isaac didn't realize that he was the sacrifice when his father bound him up and placed him on the wood. He had been through enough sacrifices every year to know the process and the procedure. He knew exactly what was going on. And he submitted himself to his father even to the point of looking like it was going to be death for him. How are we doing in our submission to what the Lord's calling us to do? We find ourselves asking stuff like, how can I get out of this instead of what can I get out of this? How can I get out of this instead of what can I get out of this? Something that will honor the Lord. We sometimes waste our suffering by neglecting or ignoring opportunities to reveal Christ to others that are watching us go through the furnace. I blew it the other day at Dairy Queen. The pastor blew it at Dairy Queen over an ice cream cone. It was important. I don't know who said that, but it was vital. I had my grandbabies with me. They'd been working with Papa, and I wanted to bless them with an ice cream cone. And I pulled up to the window after we'd already ordered the ice cream cone, so I know them suckers are sitting in there melting. And they need to be consumed right away, or it's going to go bad. I pulled up to the window. And my wife, graciously that week earlier on, had, had given me my allowance. Hallelujah. <laughs> Don't shake your head. No, you did. You did. And I pulled up to that window just as proud as punch, and I said, you know, where's my ice cream cones? And, well, it's going to cost, what, $11 or something like that for these ice cream cones because I bought me and Mike one, too, because, you know, we didn't want, we wanted to not feel left out. It's going to be this much money. And I said, okay. So I got my wallet and all I had in, I had $5, okay. And I had a $100 bill. And I gave the little person a $100 bill to buy my ice cream. I mean, last time I checked, $100 bills were still currency in the United States of America. He informed me. I can't take your $100 bill unless you buy $50 worth of stuff from the Dairy Queen. I said, there ain't no way I'm buying $50 worth of stuff. Here's the $100 bill. I just want my, just make some change. We can't make that much change. Mom, I'm losing it. My grandkids are watching. I rip my wallet back out because I know I'm going to be in trouble for this. And I dig out a credit card and I give it to him. I said, I don't know what's wrong with a $100 bill anymore. I said something like that. I don't remember exactly. It wasn't good what I said. I didn't cuss. I wasn't, but I wasn't being nice. I was not representing Jesus. In front of my grandkids and in front of Mike and, and in front of this kid that And I had to apologize to that young man for my attitude. He's following policy. Wasn't his policy. It's somebody else's policy. He's there to enforce policy, not dictate policy. And it's raining. 
Well, glory. <laughs> Aren't we happy for the rain? Yeah, you can't leave now. You just will stay and I'll preach some more, all right? <laughs> listen, I said all that to say, listen, every one of us, if we don't keep focused on the things of God in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, in a split second, the enemy can cause us to do stupid stuff. And I had to humble myself and apologize to that young man for my attitude. Now, some would say, well, it wasn't all that bad. But God said it was that bad because I wasn't representing him. And when God says something like, you better deal with it. So I dealt with it. The ice cream was good. Yesterday, listen. This coffee cup up here is a, is a Father's Day gift from one of my granddaughters. And the other granddaughter brought me a bag of, of, of Dorito potato chips. And Casey Cole brought me a whole handful of quarters. Because Papa didn't have enough money to buy a stinking ice cream cone. <laughs> and I told him, no, I'm not taking your money. We got you the ice cream. We're, you're good. God bless his little heart. Church, don't waste your suffering by neglecting or ignoring opportunities to reveal Jesus to others who are watching us go through the furnace. Watching us go through trials. If ever two suffering people re reveal Jesus Christ, it was Abraham and Isaac on, the, on Mount Moriah. Their experience is a picture of the father and the son and the cross and it is one of the most beautiful types of christ found anywhere in the old testament and jesus said in john 8 and 56 your father abraham rejoiced to see my day and he saw it and was glad in Isaac's miraculous birth, Abraham saw the day of Christ's birth. And in Isaac's marriage, he saw the day of Christ coming for his bride. But on Mount Moriah, when Isaac willingly put himself on the altar, Abraham saw the day of Christ's death and resurrection. Jesus Christ willingly went to that cross. He could have called down angels. He could have done all kinds of stuff and been redeemed from that and delivered from it. But he chose to bear your cross and my cross. He chose to give his life as a ransom. I've watched enough uh, uh, CSI and NCIS and, and, and Columbo. I, the, the, when a ransom gets, it, it's something that's paid. He paid the ransom for your life and mine, church. And God gave Abraham, according to Genesis 22, verses 16 through 18, He gave Abraham new assurances. Had these heard, had he, heard, he had heard these promises before, but now they begin to take on a fresh new meaning. Charles Spurgeon used to say that the promises of God never shine brighter than in the furnace of affliction. The promises of God never shine brighter than in the furnace of affliction. What two men did on a lonely altar would one day bring blessing to an entire world by faith Abraham submitted to the altar knowing the outcome of his death burial and resurrection Jesus Christ knew the outcome 
God said in one place in his Bible, he said, I'm not willing that any would perish, but that all would come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Church, just because God's not willing that any would perish does not mean that none will perish. Joshua said in chapter 24, Choose you this day whom you will serve as for me and my house. We're going to serve the Lord. Church, I wouldn't bet anything on tomorrow. I wouldn't bet that we're going to see next week. Things are so messed up in this world right now. I believe that God could come back. He could split the clouds and the horn can blow and Jesus can step out on a cloud and call the dead out of the grave and the rest of us right out of this place to go and meet Him in the air and be with Him in heaven. I believe it could happen just like that. And church... If we don't take care of it now, there will not be time. I guarantee you will not have time between the cloud opening and the cloud closing to make things right with God. The five, the five uh, bridesmaids didn't. They stood outside and pounded on the door. Let us in, let us in, let us in. Nope. You weren't ready when the door was open. Go back to Noah. Don't think for one second when that door shut on that boat. Don't think when it began to rain. It had never rained before until then. Don't think that they weren't standing outside that thing begging for somebody to let them in. But it was too late. They had been given a warning. Noah had given them the warning. For 120 years, he'd told them. I've been in this pulpit for I don't know how many years. And not a Sunday's gone by that there hasn't been an invitation for somebody to come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and this one won't be any different. Because God didn't call me to be a theologian. God called me to rescue lost souls. God called me to fulfill Matthew chapter 28 to go into the world and preach the gospel, make disciples. So this morning, I'm going to ask you, if you would, please, bow your heads. If you're saved, you need to be praying right now. Father, I've said everything you've asked me to say. I've done my best to stay under the anointing of God. And I've done my best to proclaim the truth of your scripture. And now with heads bowed and eyes closed and people praying, I ask you, God, right now, begin, loose your Holy Spirit to work in the hearts of your people. If you're here today, if you're here right now, and you don't know for sure that you'd make heaven your home, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. If, if God, if you don't know beyond a shadow of a doubt that if God came today that you'd make it into His kingdom, if you're not positive, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand because God wants you to be there. God's preparing a place for you. In fact, a word of the Lord came last week that said He's the preparations are finished and that He is about to come I'm not trying to scare you. I'm trying to wake you up. If you don't know Jesus and you need to, you need to raise your hand. I want to pray with you. If you're in a backslidden state, if you're away from God, and you know you're away from God, and you want to make it right today, right now is the time. Raise your hand. Yes, sir. 
God, 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 yes, sir, I see your hand, young fella. Somebody else, preacher. That's me. Come on. God's coming back for a church without spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. If that's you, raise your hand. If you raised your hand, I'm going to ask you to come meet me right here in the front. Come on. Come right here. Come right here right now. 